so that the speakers can get ready and then we will begin our morning session. Josie, sir. Uh, good morning, Subin. Good morning. Shall we start? You are ready, yes, yes. We are ready. Hope I am both visible and audible. Yes, 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 yes. Fine, I'm ready. Okay, Elsa. Okay, sir. Uh, so, our first talk is on Raymond Williams by Mr. Josie Joseph, um, Assistant Associate Professor, SB College, Shanganashiri. Uh, before I invite Mr. Josie uh, to start the talk, I invite Rose Thomas to say a few words on Mr. Josie Joseph. Good morning, everyone, respected teachers and dear friends. I'm so pleased to welcome Professor Josie Joseph to introduce the first among the fabulous 14, Raymond Williams. Mr. Josie Joseph is Associate Professor in the Department of English at SB College, Chengnashiri. He specializes in Shakespeare drama, literary theory, and cultural studies. A bilingual writer, public speaker, and translator, he is an active presence in the academic and cultural circles of Kerala. So with immense pleasure, I invite Josie sir to take up this session. Thank you, Rose, for the nice words. Uh, good morning and hearty greetings to one and all. Uh, first of all, I congratulate the English Department of Devamada College, Kuruvilangad, on thinking up a seminar series like this, Fabulous 14, as you've uh, named it, to commemorate the year 1921, which for many reasons uh, has been uh, very decisive in uh, the history of the modern world. Um, I also thank the organizers, uh, my friend Subin and uh, my friend uh, Dr. Jason Jacob the HOD and others for allowing me to be a part of this wonderful program. Thank you. Uh, the last time I came to Devamada College, Kuruvilangad was in 2000, July 2017 at the invitation of my beloved friend and former student, the late Thomas Kuriveli. Uh, I came there and gave a lecture on reading. I, I think it was part of the Literature Association uh, inauguration or something. That was the last time I came there. And the next year, in November, he left us suddenly. And I still have not come to terms with uh, his demise and the way he left us all suddenly. So I want to dedicate this, my, this lecture to his memory, uh, my beloved Tommy. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Raymond Williams. And it is very fitting that we begin the series of lectures uh, with Raymond Williams, because in many ways he is a man who revolutionized this discipline called literature, this discipline called English studies. I think we can safely uh, argue or, or, or pronounce that you know English literature, or literary studies, uh, can be divided into two phases: before Raymond Williams and after Raymond Williams. He did to our discipline this, and I'm talking about this totality of English studies, literature as a discourse, as a discipline, this network of relations, the way we deal with texts, the way we teach, the way we, we think about them, all these things, the totality. Well, he revolutionized it. He, he, he changed the terms of engagement uh, with literature and with society, with, cult, with, with, with culture, all those cultural practice. He changed the way we understand the concept of culture. That is perhaps the single most important contribution uh, to the world, uh, because he gave us ways of radically reimagining the concept of culture and, it, uh, and its relationship with society. Um, I'm not saying that he is the only person who did this, but he was certainly the most important, uh, the, 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 the first and foremost name that comes to mind when we think of this, the, the, this, this radical change that has 
come over this discipline and this discourse. Raymond Williams did to literary studies or English studies, uh, what he did to English studies was uh, something like what Karl Marx did to the study of society or something like what uh, Sigmund Freud did to the study of the human mind. I want to repeat that term that I used earlier, he changed the terms of engagement, the way we look at this whole thing. Now, uh, this was possible, I believe, because he always remained a critical insider. Or maybe he considered himself as an outsider, so to say. Uh, he, the, the border metaphor is something that is always associated with Raymond Williams. He was always interested in, uh, in, in the idea of the border, that, that, that uncanny uh, liminality of being caught up in two cultures or, 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 or refusing to be a, a singular or unitary identity. He was Welsh and he always retained that Welsh identity. He never considered himself a British. He would always describe himself as a Welsh European. And that's the first thing that I want to highlight about Raymond Williams. And uh, this is important bearing on his work. I'll come to that. And the second point is that Raymond Williams comes from a, a, a working class background. And this is very crucial to the understanding of Raymond Williams' thoughts and his work. And he was very proud about being an ordinary person and not being uh, part of a great legacy or tradition of, or, or, or having been born with culture or intellectual privileges. No, he belongs to a very ordinary or poor uh, labor working class family in uh, the rural village in South Wales. And he belongs to the first generation of working class students to go to the big universities of Oxford or Cambridge. He studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. I'll come to that. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think it is this working class background that helped him to look at all these, these, these structures of learning, all these texts and practices in a different perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then the third point uh, about Raymond Williams is that he was always interested in looking at, uh, at language, at communication, you know, this whole network of uh, language, meaning, uh, communication, representation, all, all, all those things. This was a lifelong obsession with him and he was always interested in the way we understand and talk uh, and use certain words and concepts. Yeah, I'll come to that. It's a very important central argument about Raymond Williams' work and contribution. Uh, and he was a very, very talented, uh, precocious uh, mind, brilliant guy, who was equally critical and creative. Not many people remember that he was a great novelist as well. He was a, in fact, he, he wanted to write more novels and to completely turn to fiction towards the end of his life. And his dream project was to write a huge uh, series of, uh, of novels um, about his Welsh culture or the cultural tradition of uh, his Welsh background, his, his Welsh village. And he, I think he called it the people of the Black Mountains. And uh, at the time of his death in 1988, he had actually prepared only two of the first, uh, only the first two volumes of what he intended as a very long project of some 20,000 or 25,000 pages. And uh, the first two volumes were published posthumously by his wife, Joyce, the joy of his life. Uh, and uh, but, but, but so Raymond Williams, a novelist, could not realize all his dreams or all what he wanted to achieve in life. But he had already published several novels during his lifetime. The first novel that he published, in, that was in 1960, it's called border country, again, you have that border metaphor, which again is talking about, uh, you know, of, 
of his Welsh background and his identity now as a preeminent British intellectual, public intellectual scholar, this Cambridge professor and all that. Uh, it is a very beautiful novel, autobiographical, and uh, there is so much of, uh, of, of his life and his experience uh, in the story of the, the, the protagonist of the novel. Anyway, now, um, his father uh, and his grandfather, they were all uh, laborers. Uh, and the good starting point of understanding Raymond Williams, I would say, is his essay, one of his earliest pieces, Culture is Ordinary. An essay, beautiful essay. I would say it is the best piece he ever wrote. Uh, and uh, those students who are listening to me, uh, if you're planning to read upon Raymond Williams, that is my intention giving this lecture. I want to inspire at least a few of you to take up his work and read some of his major texts. And I don't know how many of you will turn to Raymond Williams, but if you are willing to read at least one text by Raymond Williams, let it be Culture is Ordinary. That is the, the, the central argument of his entire body of work, that culture is ordinary. In it, there is this beautiful line. He keeps repeating that sentence. I think that, that phrase, culture is ordinary, occurs around a dozen or so times in that whole essay. Uh, culture is ordinary. That is where we should begin. We should start. You have that line, I think, in the second stanza, the second paragraph. And so maybe I should also begin with that text. Culture is ordinary. This was written in 1958 and was published in uh, an anthology of essays called Conviction, uh, edited by Norman McKinsey. And uh, by the time Raymond Williams had already published his first book, Culture and Society, his most famous book, most important book. And so he was already a, a, a familiar figure. And uh, this was a, a, a collection of essays, as the title indicates, about the convictions, the ideological convictions of these writers or contributors to this anthology. There was one piece by Norman Mackenzie himself and another by the British novelist Iris Murdoch and, uh, and Richard Hoggart also wrote an essay to the, for this collection. Now, in Culture is Ordinary, uh, it, that essay begins with a beautiful description of his Welsh landscape and he talks about his father and his grandfather and uh, the life, the simple life of that uh, agrarian village, the village Pandy in South Wales. Uh, and his grandfather was a farm labourer and this, this description of this grandfather being evicted of, of his cottage and then weeping in the parish meeting that Sunday and how he remembers that and he remembers his father who was a laborer and then he became a railway porter and ending up a signal man and how he he started the trade union in that village and how he was a secretary of the communist party and the local secretary of the party and how they were all the, the labor uh, uh, you know people and had this political affiliation to the Labour Party and all that, those things. Uh, and uh, he also remembers the general strike of 1926 as a small, and not in that essay, it is somewhere else, okay. Uh, and then um, Raymond Williams uh, goes to the local school and he uh, was a precocious child, very good at studies, so he gets admission to the King's Grammar School, which was actually a, a great achievement. He would consider this as a greater achievement than going to Cambridge, considering the circumstances. And then uh, when he was a young student at a very uh, young age, I think when he was 16 or so, he went to Geneva as part of a, a student uh, group uh, to attend a conference for youngsters organized by the then League of Nations. And then um, on the way back, there was a stopover at Paris and this young boy and his friends, they went to see around the city. Of course, there was teachers accompanying them and there was this huge international exhibition going on in Paris at the time. 
And he went to that exhibition and he went straight to the Soviet pavilion and there he found a copy of the Communist Manifesto, perhaps given for free of cost, as I imagine, and part of the Soviet propaganda in those days, or maybe at a very small price. And anyway, he bought a copy and he began reading that book, The Communist Manifesto, A Spectre is Haunting Europe, The Spectre of Communism. And he was overwhelmed by that and he remained a leftist all his life. Uh, was he a Marxist uh, communist in the in, in, in the familiar sense of the term? Well, I doubt. He held the membership of the Communist Party only for less than two years, maybe 18 months to be precise. Uh, and he had his differences of opinion with the, the, the dogmatic or orthodoxy of communism. For example, the traditional, uh, you know, uh, Marxist position about literature as, as propagandist, as a, a, a literature that ought to be propagandist or, or promoting the, the cause of revolution and all that, he rejected completely. Uh, and uh, he also had many other differences. Uh, he was ve very liberal. He was accommodative of alternate positions. That is something that, that, that I would say beautiful about Raymond Williams as a thinker. He's never uh, intolerant to a difference of opinion. He's not the kind of scholar who would uh, dismiss an opinion which is contrary to his own conviction. He would always listen to the other perspective and he, was, he would always try to bridge a gap, he, he, to, to find a common ground. Uh, that is, I think, what makes him most, what made him most effective. Uh, you cannot just uh, dismiss Raymond Williams as belonging to this one particular category. So he was not just a Marxist uh, critic or scholar in that sense of the term, but he was a leftist. All his life he was leftist. Anyway, uh, coming back to his life, uh, he won a state scholarship and went to Cambridge. He studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. And there he says... Uh, I told you earlier he was he belonged to the first generation of students coming from the working class to go to the big university. Richard Hoggart is another name that comes to my mind. And when these uh, stu students and uh, Eric Hobsbawm was the, the senior was uh, Raymond Williams the senior four or five years at, at Cambridge at the time. F. R. Lewis was uh, this big name most famous English teacher in the whole world and everybody was under his spell, under his influence. There's a whole uh, culture of opinions, I would say, the whole, whole, whole climate of opinions, I would say, what we today term as Leavism. Uh, and it, it was at the peak when Raymond Williams went there as a student. Well, he was not overwhelmed by the, the, the grandeur of... Uh, of the university. He stood his ground. He would write about it later that, you know, he carried with him a, 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 twenty, a tradition of 20 centuries of Welsh upbringing of, 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 of that cultural tradition. So why should he feel a complex? Why should he feel inferior or, or, or uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the huge campus of uh, Cambridge? Of course, he felt that he uh, will always remain a, a, an outsider there. And, and he always had that feeling that he did not actually belong to uh, Cambridge because Cambridge and Oxford, all those big universities for, the, for those matter, catered to the interest of a particular class, you know, uh, of uh, the privileged class. And one of uh, Raymond Williams' greatest contributions, I would say, is to change that and and to and to expand the horizons of the intellectual community and with his own uh, formidable presence as a, as a scholar and the kind of experiential wisdom that he brings in of a different culture of a different tradition of a different perspective he certainly enlarged i would say the minds of uh, all those who we came to contact with and his uh, problem with 
the mainstream academic community, the intellectual traditions of Europe, was that it was not democratic enough. Uh, and he was all his life trying to democratize societies. He wanted Europe, he wanted England to be more democratic. Uh, okay, now, uh, years later, when uh, the university brought out a special souvenir book titled My Cambridge, and, uh, and it asked all the famous alumni to contribute. Raymond Williams also got the invitation, and he wrote a, a curious piece, and the opening line was, it was never my Cambridge. That was clear right from the start. It was never my Cambridge, not my kind of uh, university. So that's why I said, you know, he always remained that critical insider and who brought in an, an outside perspective. And I should say that uh, this was something you will find in a number of uh, early scholars and practitioners of culture studies. Stuart Hall, for example. Stuart, I was reading his uh, memoirs, The uh, Familiar Stranger. You know, the title itself indicates Familiar Stranger. Uh, he was a Jamaican uh, coming from the Caribbean islands, coming to England and becoming a very influential scholar, teacher here. And he also carried that, 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 uh, that duality of identities, that, that liminality or that border metaphor, if I may go back to that, uh, that, that concept again. Uh, so uh, you could say this about E.P. Thompson. You could say this, even though E.P. Thompson was uh, at... Uh, affiliations to the, the the common people from a theoretical perspective, but in all practical matters, he remained part of the the the, uh, the aristocracy, so to say. Richard Hoggart, uh, working class background again, but a predominant name in uh, in the fifties and sixties uh, in England in English studies. Now, I just uh, mentioned the names of the four founding figures of culture studies. Right, uh, and culture studies you all know emerged in 1964 as uh, an independent uh, discourse or discipline or a, or a field of academic study at Birmingham. The, when the center, this center was opened, the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Culture Studies (BCCCS) was was established in 1964. But if you look at the four. Uh, five or six years prior to that, you will see that coming actually, the, 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 the groundwork being done. Uh, I, a few in, uh, landmark texts come to mind immediately. The first one, of course, is uh, Richard Hoggart's book, The Uses of Literacy, 1957 book. And then, of course, Raymond Williams' first book, Culture and Study, uh, Society, which came out in 1958. Uh, I want to say more on this book. Uh, then you have uh, Raymond Williams' own book, the, that long that that long revolution, which came out in 1961. Uh, then E. P. Thompson's book on the history of the English working class, 1963, uh, uh, I think 62 or 63. And so, and then you have the inauguration of the Birmingham Centre. So what I'm trying to say is that 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 confluence of ideas and the key figures coming together and uh, uh, and working. And then Stuart Hall, in one of his interviews, I remember uh, talking about one of the meetings they had in uh, Raymond Williams' room in Jesus College where he was teaching. And, uh, and that room that Raymond Williams was staying in was a very room that Coldridge had used earlier when he was a student at the same college. So sitting in the room that once called you had used, and these founding figures, you know, of culture studies were plotting this new revolution, this cultural revolution, what Raymond Williams uh, described as a long revolution. Okay, now I want to say something about this book, Culture and Society. Uh, this is a defining book, I would say. This is the one book that changed it all. And uh, this is, uh, it took some time for Raymond Williams to write and publish uh, you know, this book. I would say almost a decade. Because the trigger of this book 
came in 1948 when T.S. Eliot published his essay on or that long tract on culture, notes towards the definition of culture. And uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, in many ways, was continuing that uh, the Arnoldian tradition uh, sustained by Levis. So the Arnoldian notion of uh, about culture, about education, about tradition, which was continued in many ways by Levis, F.R. Levis, even though Levis was such a wonderful scholar and a very influential teacher and all that. But there was this, this whole uh, yearning for a, for, for a, or a nostalgic yearning for, a, for certain traditional values, certain uh, notions of culture, which Raymond Williams would later critique as not being inclusive enough, not being democratic enough, uh, not being representative enough. So Elit, you, also, you know, uh, had this very uh, uh, strange notions about culture and tradition and all, all that. So this was a trigger. And then um, he, in the meantime, you, you know, uh, uh, I should again go back to Raymond Williams' life. Uh, you know, after when he was a student at uh, Cambridge, Trinity College, Cambridge, the Second World War began, and then he was immediately listed in the army, it's compulsory military service, and he was away for four years, and he was in Europe uh, fighting against the Germans. He was elevated to the position of a captain, actually. He became a captain uh, in the fourth year or so. And then in 1945, at the end of the hostilities, he came back and completed his studies and took his degree. And then for the next 10 years or so, he worked as an adult education tutor. And that was a, a tremendous uh, influence in his life for the rest of his life. Uh, he was teaching the working class people, the laborers, you know, uh, and uh, England at the time, London in particular, Sussex, he was actually appointed at Sussex and was full of the working class people, all these factories, the industrial installations, all those things. And uh, there, there were these illiterate people or people who uh, were the, the, the workforce of the factories and the industrial establishments. And Raymond Williams was teaching them, some of them, and he spent about 10 years. And, uh, and, and, and that actually uh, helped him reimagine the, uh, the, 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 these concepts of uh, culture, of education, about literature, about literacy, all those things. And he began writing about these things. And he began showing his friends about he, he was writing and eventually this book came out in 1958 and this book came out he, he, he was not a lecturer yet and that had to wait uh, for a few more years actually he became a lecturer at Jesus College uh, and also a university lecturer at Cambridge in, only in 1961 and partly because of this book because of fame of uh, achieved by this book or uh, and, uh, now in this book, Culture and Society, you will find everything that he would touch upon later in his life. So in many ways, this is the, uh, the fundamental Raymond Williams work and everything that he wrote after it actually evolves out of it. You think of all those major books and he was a very prolific writer. I think he's written about 30 books. Uh, if you exclude all those fictional works, you will still have uh, about, about, about 24 or 25 uh, critical texts. All those works actually evolve out of the arguments that he presents in this book. Now, uh, he, uh, he takes a five keywords. Now, keywords is again a, a term that we associate with Raymond Williams. That also happens. That also happens to be the title of his uh, very important book, uh, kind of dictionary, not the dictionary in the usual term, but a kind of a critical glossary where he takes up 131 
key words of our critical vocabulary, the words that all students of literature use uh, on a regular basis on our everyday uh, writings and speech, those key words. Uh, and uh, this came out in uh, 1976 and it was uh, revised and expanded in 1983. But if you look at culture and society, you will have the, uh, the, 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 the template. In fact, uh, Raymond Williams wanted to give a glossary attached to this book, his first book, and the publisher did not allow it because the book was already 400, it's very long, from 480 pages long. And he had actually thought of uh, writing short notes of about 200 words. And uh, finally, he reduced the number to about 60 and he had prepared a glossary of 60 keywords, technical terms, and attached to the manuscript and gave to the publisher. But the publisher said, no, no, that would make the book too long. And what did Raymond Williams do? He then took five of the keywords and analyzed those five words in the introduction. And what are these five words? These five words are, of course, culture, and then industry, class, democracy, and art. These are the five key words uh, that he analyzes in this book. And in, in some sense, the whole book is an exploration of these five terms, of these five concepts uh, in the larger correlation between culture and society. So, or, or, or in the larger socio-historical context. Now, his central argument is that these words have changed meaning. Now, from the 18th century onwards, that's his argument. If you look at the, uh, uh, the book, the, it has a subtitle of a period given, 1780 to 1950. So he's looking at that transformation. And 1780, you, we know, is around the time where we had all the, the two revolutions, the French Revolution, the uh, uh, the, the the American uh, Revolution, and then you had the Industrial Revolution. All these revolutions coming and changing uh, the uh, you know the, the the shape of the world. Now Raymond Williams's contention is that many of these words that we use today, these critical words, either emerged or changed meaning. There were words which were not there earlier or most of these words that change meaning. So his work is actually a kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of semantic analysis, the way the words emerged, the etymology, and the way these words change meaning. I'll just say something about these five words. Take the word industry. Raymond Williams' argument is that, you know, until the 18th century, the word industry only meant hard work, diligence, perseverance. So you had the qualitative adjective industrious. So industry means hard work. And after the industrial revolution, when we actually began to have all these factories and these installations, suddenly industry changed its meaning. Now, today, we know the familiar meaning of the word industry is this new meaning. right? And now you have the adjective industrial, and that word did not exist before the 18th century at all. So you have a new word, industrial, and then uh, later, by the end of the 19th century or the 20th century, you have uh, this concept of industrialism as well. So industrial, industry, uh, it becomes a, 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 a completely new entity, and all those words and concepts that we can associate with this new idea. Class, another uh, example, uh, that word, uh, it's a familiar word, but it had only one meaning, the way we use it in our, in our college, as a classroom or the class of uh, uh, the first year class, or uh, giving a, take a class, teachers taking a class. That, that was the word, that was the meaning of the word. And the other meaning that we today have for the, uh, for the word did not exist 
until the uh, you know this 18th century this period and we had this this concept of rank uh, which was more specific but the word class uh, relating to social groups or this hierarchy of uh, the society uh, is something new goes the argument and he also looks at all those related words like middle class lower class upper class and all those things a word like the lower middle class emerged only in the 20th century right not even in the 19th century we didn't have that word lower middle class until the 20th century so uh, then art similarly art only meant skill so an artist only meant anybody who had some skill so uh, the same as artisan okay but in the uh, in the 19th century in particular art became something specialized some uh, uh, very highly specialized creative activity and artists became special individuals endowed with special talent and uh, this is some raymond williams calls this as a myth actually there is a interesting essay in culture and society about the romantic artist an idea that he would take up and return to repeatedly in his later works uh, he says you know this is actually a myth an illusion this romantic artist the special genius and all the all, all those things now which you can uh, see is a, 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 a marxist perspective on um, on art okay um, contextualizing it in the specific historical and political uh, compulsion of the period and Uh, and re- rejecting this argument about uh, the artist as a prophet or this blessed individual or anything like that anyway uh, so this is how he 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 uh, goes forward and then if, in this book he looks at the 19th century tradition he talks about uh, matthew arnold in particular there's a essay on matthew arnold and cardinal newman and their influences and uh, how matthew arnold actually uh, gave the template for all of us to think about culture and this whole notion of culture as an aspirational value as an elitist value now he talks about culture i forgot to mention that culture the original uh, meaning of the word if you look at it it's etymology it's related to agriculture the tending of growth of uh, Uh, of a plant or a organism or organic growth and then uh, by association uh, about human training but then later uh, culture began to expand its meaning and now we can identify five or six or seven or more meanings of the word culture and but it's around this period that culture became an entity of its own so uh, culture and it is very difficult to talk about it in fact his famous entry on culture in keywords begins with with this the the, the, the sentence there was a statement that culture is one of the two or more two or three most complicated words of the english language that's how the entry begins uh, and he talks about the ideology uh, that has now come to define culture in specific terms and then he wants to highlight this argument that culture is ordinary again that i say that he wrote in the same year as, as culture and society in 1958 that culture is ordinary it is a whole way of life the totality of human experiences everything that we do culture is about shared meanings of this uh, of of of, uh, of producing and and circulating meanings all those ideas now every student knows uh, thanks to culture studies but this discipline i told you did not exist until 1964 and it took a long time for culture studies to be accepted in mainstream academic uh, society in england and the english universities and colleges uh, and it took again a couple of decades more for culture studies to reach uh, the outside world in india uh, culture studies emerged in india only uh, 10 or 15 years ago or two, or, or two decades at the most uh, there was no culture studies of 
paper in the syllabus in the last century. Certainly not. It's only in the 20th. And now we look at literature as being part of uh, uh, culture, the larger framework of culture. There is earlier culture and history and society. All these things were looked at as just the context for the analysis of uh, literature. Anyway, Raymond Williams changed the, all that. Then, uh, I okay, I, I think uh, I don't have much time left, so I'll just talk about his, some of his other works. The second work that he wrote in 1961, titled That uh, Long Revolution, uh, you know, talks about this cultural revolution that's happening in English society. Uh, as a result of industrialization. And he called, he, he is, is, is as important as the, as, a, as, as the democratic revolution that happened or the industrial revolution that happened. Now you, now you have the cultural revolution, which is an expansion of our society. And uh, he looks at the, the, the various implications of this long revolution. Now, uh, this book also continues many of the familiar arguments that he raised in culture and, uh, and society. The first chapter, for example, is an essay on creativity. It's called The Creative Mind. Again, he looks at the notion of the artist as, uh, or art as special. No, he rejects that idea and he says art, artist is ordinary. This is culture is ordinary. And then in the second chapter, which is titled The Analysis of Culture, he introduces the very important uh, uh, that today we associate with Raymond Williams, that is structures of feeling. Now, structures of feeling, uh, Stuart Fall would call it an oxymoron, because how can structure, uh, how can feeling, uh, can uh, how can feeling have structures? Well, that is precisely the point. Uh, you know, uh, you could say it is a, it is related to the Gramscian idea of hegemony or this notion of ideology. Or this, 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 the or, or the the concept of the political unconscious that uh, Frederick Jameson talks about, you know, all those things that that uh, something that is felt instinctively, it's not easy to define it. That's why he uses the word feeling. It's an abstract notion, but then you 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 sense it, you feel it, and just as. Uh, Lacan uh, talked about the unconscious being structured like a uh, language. Raymond Williams is talking about these ideological feelings as having structures of their own. So uh, it's a very tricky argument and he takes it up later uh, in his 1977 book Marxism and Literature, a very important book in which he introduces the concept of cultural materialism as well. There is a whole a chapter on the structures of feeling. And in that book, he also talks about the three uh, elements of culture in any society, the dominant, the residual, and the emergent uh, elements or phases of culture. That's a very important book. Uh, I'll say something about that book uh, a little later. Now, um, I want to talk about a third book by Raymond Williams. It's The Country and the City. Wonderful book. Uh, it's a very long book, about 500, nearly 500 pages, but many critics say that this is a foundational text of eco-criticism. Uh, it's a book that influenced uh, Edward Sy the lot, particularly he refers to this book in uh, uh, Cultural and Imperialism, how this book in influenced him. Now, this is, it, it's a book about this binary, country and city, and uh, uh, he looks at the representation of uh, country and the city right from the 16th century in our literary texts, in the mainstream literary discourse. And his argument is that, you know, uh, the these two are actually connected, but somehow if you look at the representations in literary discourses, there is uh, a separation of the two and they're often uh, imagined as uh, opposites polar opposites, having different uh, sets of values, nature and all that, uh, and which is itself uh, uh, complicated and contradictory because the, the city, uh, for example, is sometimes imagined as being progressive, modern, 
uh, sophisticated, enlightened, and all that. But at the same time, in most literary representations, you see the city as the, the uh, as a dirty place. The city as uh, the, uh, an embodiment of all evils of uh, modernity, of industrialization, or, or being a wicked place, as contrasted to the country, which is always. Uh, represented in idyllic terms as this place of uh, purity, of innocence, of honesty, you know, all, all those things. Now, uh, Raymond Williams problematizes this. Uh, Raymond Williams simply refuses to accept this binary. And he says the country is equally wicked. You know, he calls out on this, 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 uh, this construct about the country as uh, being innocent, pure, and, and, and all that. And I remember our own Kamaradas uh, talking about this many, many years ago. She used to say that uh, this is a myth that Natan Boram Nannagalal Samartham, that is Chumma Kallam Parayinana. Natan Boram Tanetto Mudala Kushumbun Gunnayimi Dushtadaru Uchanijatta Jahadi Idokke Avala Natan Boram Tanetto Nagaram Karchoda Namukha Swandriyan Thirinu You have the anonymity, you can do whatever you want and move around, whereas in the countryside, everybody knows everybody else, and you're always uh, being watched and judged and all that. Uh, well, Raymond Williams wrote about that many, many years ago uh, in 1961. And so it's a wonderful uh, analysis of uh, literary representation. See, this is the, uh, the, the, the kind of perspective that he brings in. This is how he deals with literature. And it's a profound study, right from 16th century. He looks at all these uh, images in poetry, in Shakespeare, uh, in all these um, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century writers, and how they've represented the country and uh, uh, the city. Uh, now I move on to the, uh, the other book, Marxism and Literature, 1977 book, uh, the book uh, that introduces concept of uh, cultural materialism. Even though he had used that term earlier in an essay on Marx, which he uh, published uh, earlier, he had used that phrase, cultural materialism. Uh, but it is in this book that it is actually elaborated. And, uh, and it was made popular actually by uh, uh, Jonathan Dolimar and uh, Alan Sinfield in 1985, when they published the book Political Shakespeare, it had the subtitle Essays in Cultural Materialism. Actually, it is this book that popularized the concept or the term cultural materialism. Uh, but the idea was introduced by Raymond Williams. Now, this is in many ways a revision of the Marxist position, the Marxist model, the classical Marxist model of the base structure, superstructure, and how everything is determined by the 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 the, uh, the uh, economic relations in society and how culture belongs to the superstructure and so therefore is a reflection of the economic relations uh, in society. Now Raymond Williams's position is that of course there is a, a, a great deal of uh, economic compulsion or, or influence in the way culture is produced, but then culture is not a mere reflection of the economic relations. So uh, he, 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 he wants to highlight the productive nature of culture and how uh, culture also influences society and the, 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 the dynamic nature of culture or that interaction uh, between uh, cultural expressions and the social order. Um, and so that is... Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the critics that belong to the school, cultural materialism, uh, and they look at the socio-political context of production, not only of production, but also the socio-political context of reception. So how is a Shakespeare text read today? How do you do Shakespeare today? How do you do Shakespeare, say, in the, in the, in the, in the third world? Uh, the, 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 uh, the, racial representation in Shakespeare, uh, what about the marginal subjectivities? Uh, how do you deal with, with all that? The power relations in operation in uh, 
you know, Shakespeare takes in its uh, performance? What about the politics of the Elizabethan stage as such? Uh, what does it mean to be the, the Lord Chamberlain's men or the King's men? Uh, what does it mean to be the Royal Shakespeare Society? You know, all those. And why was uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth particularly worried about the staging of Richard II and um, prior to the Essex Rebellion? You know, all those things. And together with its cousin, the American cousin, New Historicism, uh, led by Stephen Greenblatt and others, uh, uh, this actually extended the project that Raymond Williams began and was also something that was uh, was 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 uh, triggered by the uh, new work that was emerging from Birmingham, the Center for Contemporary Culture Studies, and together, you know, uh, the the as I said at the beginning, uh, the, it offered a radical reimagining of uh, literature. Now uh, I realize that I have. Uh, exceeded my time limit. There's another lecture after mine, so I'll just wind up with a... Uh, I, actually, I want to say something more on a few more books uh, of uh, Raymond Williams. He, he, yeah, I forgot to mention his interest in drama because he was basically a teacher of drama. Uh, he was a dramatist as well. He has written a few plays as well. But he uh, wrote several critical studies on drama Drama in performance, for example, or drama from Ibsen to Brecht, and then his uh, book Modern Tragedy, which is actually a response to uh, Steiner's book, uh, The Death of Tragedy. Uh, and uh, I don't know. hello, okay. Um, I'll wind up in a few minutes, okay? Right, just a couple of minutes. Then he was a professor of drama at Cambridge. I think he was. A professor of uh, drama in Cambridge and he taught there for 20 years uh, drama. And so that is another aspect of uh, Raymond Williams and I just want to wind up uh, with an observation he makes uh, in his last book which is actually published posthumously a collection of his essays uh, Resources of Hope there's a very interesting uh, observation that he makes uh, that about being radical and he says to be truly radical is to make hope possible and not despair convincing. Now, I would say this is actually the difference between cultural materialism and new historicism as well. New historicism, in spite of its leftist convictions, is largely pessimistic. It does not actually believe in the possibility of revolution. And so much of new historicism ends up as textual analysis. Whereas cultural materialism is hopeful, it still believes that revolution is possible, if not tomorrow, at least someday. And so what is more important is to be optimistic about and, and, and keep pushing the uh, boundaries and doing whatever little that one can in the immediate surrounding that one is in. And so uh, even this seminar or this session where we are remembering Raymond Williams, I think, is a, 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 a way forward of making our society more democratic. But that is what Raymond Williams was trying all his life to make it make this world more just, more equitable, more representative, more inclusive, and more democratic uh, place for all of us. And for that, it is very important for us to be hopeful for, for for us to be optimistic and keep trying. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, if the participants want to ask any questions, they can ask them now or type them in the chat box. Thank you, Josisa, for this wonderful session. And mostly people remember uh, Raymond Williams for the critical contribution that he has made. And for him, there is another side uh, as a creative writer, as a dramatist and as a novelist. He has contributed to the world. But, you know, that was missing. I think uh, uh, there was uh, 
in 2005 there was uh, a you know regeneration or recreation of the novels which was out of print uh, some library edition uh, do you remember that uh he has his welsh trilogy uh, I, i think i talked about that i began yeah, you, with uh, yeah, william williams a novel is border country is the first novel which came out in 1960 and the second novel was uh, titled second generation and there's a third novel i forgot uh manod i forgot that title those three books constitute the the trilogy the welsh trilogy and then uh, i told you how he wanted to write this uh, huge Uh, fictional history of uh, is the welsh tradition he had actually envisaged to write about 25000 pages but unfortunately he could complete only the first two volumes and those were brought out uh, many years after his death maybe you are talking about those two works uh, but i think overall he has some uh, six or seven novels to his credit but he actually considered uh, himself as a a good novelist and uh, he wanted to be known as a novelist as a, as, a, as a creative writer rather than a critical writer and who knows if only he had lived a little longer he was only 67 when he suddenly died of a heart attack in 1988 in january 1988 so if only he had lived a few more years maybe he, he could have uh, more of raymond williams the 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 the, the novelist yeah i completely agree with you yeah any other question or response no Uh, sir thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful talk on Raymond Williams i'm pretty sure that all of us who has not read uh, his cultural history uh, will now read it because you have now sparked um, a curiosity on raymond williams so it was very interesting to learn about how raymond williams radically imagined the concept of culture and um, how he Uh, brought in the concept of cultural materialism, and also about the difference between uh, cultural materialism and uh, new historicism. So, thank you so much for such an entertaining talk. Um, we really had a good time. Thank you, sir. since we lag in time we will go directly to the next session elsa